Good? Yes? Yeah? Yeah. Good fellowship. All right. Um, we've kind of, we got impact coming up here soon, and um, Kristen has been kind of working hard on something that she wanted to show you guys, and then, um, yeah, we're just uh, here to kind of ask for help, whoever wants to help and all that good stuff, and so we've got kind of a video to show you real quick, and then we'll go from there. So here, give us one second. In true Prairie Creek fashion, we're having some technical difficulties, so this is our last minute idea, so we are going to pray God help this work. Ready. Okay, so it didn't quite work. Sorry about that. Um, but the lyrics to that song, you guys, um, it starts out, Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line. With all the other not quites, with all the other never get it rights, but it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. 
because I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. And ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. Right? So that's our goal. That's what we do at Impact. We want to have a place for our kids to learn and grow. Um, and we want to invite the kids in our community and we want to give them a place to belong um, because that's who Jesus sought out, right? It was the nobodies. Um, so our, this is our mission of impact, to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ through gospel, community, and mission. Um, this is our church's mission as well. It doesn't change for impact. Our vision is to boldly proclaim the gospel, inviting people into authentic community with Jesus and with one another, and equipping them to continue the mission of Jesus. Um, that's the same for our youth. Uh, they were designed with gifts, um, just like adults are, right? Like that doesn't start once you turn 30, that starts now. Um, and so our goal is to meet every Wednesday, give them a place where they can learn and grow in their relationship with God. We're going to give kids an opportunity to enter into a relationship with God if they don't know him as their savior. And then we want So we need everybody. Um, we've got a great team. I'm so thankful. Stephanie stepped up last year, and she has coordinated all of the kitchen meal thing, whatever. She handles all of that, and I'm so thankful. When you look back at those pictures from the early days, if you guys remember when we were down at the building on Main Street, I'm kind of shocked anybody allowed their kids to come. Like, it was so, we just, like, stacked chairs and moved them to the sides, and we had roasters that we would bring food in, and we would have the kids literally sit backwards on their chair and, like, use their chair as a table to eat. Um, we've come a long way. God has gifted us this building and the kitchen downstairs. Um, studies show that food um, triggers memories, right? And so, like, Feeding these kids is something we feel super passionate about. Um, and so serving in the kitchen is not a little job. It's a huge job. Um, you know, for some of our kids, it may be their only warm meal they're eating. You know, it may be a, the only meal that someone else is preparing that they're not heating up themselves, right? And so what a gift if these kids grow up to be adults and they remember feeling loved and welcomed by food, right? So Stephanie has taken over that. Thank you, Stephanie. That's such a gift. Um, she can always use help in the kitchen. Um, so whether that's serving food, preparing food before impact starts, or if you want to brown ground beef, we go through so much ground beef, um, and drop it off to her. If you want to freeze it, whatever, um, she will always take that. So see her with any food questions. Um, and then we have a transportation team. So right now we have um, Dennis and Linda, who are willing to do some pickup for us. Um, we have a lot of single moms. It's hard for them to get their kids to impact. Maybe they're working. Um, a lot of kids walk, ride their bikes. We would love some more help with that. So if you have a vehicle, uh, driver's license, insurance, and you are willing to pick up some kids for us, come see us. We would love your help with that. Um, this year, I felt really convicted that I need to pass off some things that I don't do well. Um, social media is one of that. I just, not my strength, right? So I'm looking for someone who can help me communicate better with parents and with students. Um, if that's something that you feel like you could do, come see me. I would love your help. Um, and then I'm also looking for someone just to help me with some of the administration type stuff. Um, I really do not have joy going and printing off like materials for impact. Um, and we need to do better with that. We need to do better sending home reminders with students. So if you are gifted with the gift of administration, I am not. I would love your help. If that's something that you could do, I come see me. We'd love your help with that. Um, next slide, please. 
So then I just want to walk you through what a normal night at impact looks like. So our first through fifth grade group is from four to five every night. Um, if you volunteer to be some sort of helper on Wednesday nights, it's okay if you bring your kids. Um, we have Miss Tammy Sagers, um, who has faithfully served since the beginning in our first grade classroom. She will also take your preschool aged kids. So if you want to volunteer, but you have some kids that aren't quite old enough to be an impact, they can go in Miss Tammy's classroom. Um, Miss Tammy is such a gift. That alone should be a reason to volunteer is for your kids to sit under Miss Tammy's teaching. She is such a joy. Um, so anyway, we meet right away. Amanda Fainer has taken over the first through fifth grade group, and she does a great job. Um, we do a little game for the first 15 minutes, and then we go ahead and divide up into small groups. So um, our goal, remember, is community. And so we want to start this at the first through fifth grade level and then build in middle school and then build all the way up to high school. So what we do is we gather, we watch a video, and then we divide up into small groups. So we have sec second and third grade boys together, second and third grade girls together, vice versa. Um, we watch a little video and then we divide up into small groups and we just spend 10 minutes talking about the lesson. Um, so we are looking for some leaders to step up and fill those positions. Um, as a leader, we're looking for someone who is committing to being there for the entire semester. These kids need consistency, and so they need your commitment to show up every Wednesday. Um, another thing we're really excited for is, you know, training up these kids. So uh, Mia Rikes was a great teacher last year, and Nicole helped her. Um, grow into that position where she sat next to her and let Mia take the reins and teach this fourth and fifth grade girls group. Um, Emma Han's another one. She's willing to do that this year. So my goal is to sit beside her and just kind of help her step into this leadership role. Um, men, we need you. Um, you know, when I think of James and the call to care for the widows and the orphans, um, you know, then I take it a step further and I go, who's a spiritual orphan? Who doesn't have parents who are loving them and leading them in the ways of Jesus? And then I go, maybe they have a mom who's pursuing the Lord, but how many of these kids don't have a dad pursuing the Lord? And they don't even know what a healthy marriage looks like. They don't know what a dad pursuing Jesus looks like. Um, so for these boys, you guys, I can't tell you, men, we need you to step up. We need some help um, in this area. So um, we have leaders, we have somebody at the front just greeting kids, saying hello, making sure they're checked in, making sure we have all the necessary paperwork. Um, we need somebody who can be the check-in person for behaviors. Um, we're going to try to be more strict with that this year and curbing some behaviors right from the start, but we need someone who's not afraid to go in and say, like, hey, I see you're struggling, how are you doing? Um, and pull kids aside and have some of that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and then we need helpers. So maybe you don't feel comfortable in a teaching role, you know, for 10 minutes with these kids, um, but maybe you're willing to be a support person. Um, we invite you to come, and one of us who has been, you know, more in that teaching role will sit beside you. We'll do the teaching. You can sit and you can learn. Um, and then if that's something that you feel like God's leading you to, we'd love to train you up and then equip you. Maybe second semester you look at taking over a group. Um, so this is the format for all the age groups. So if we would go to the next slide, please. Um, so then middle school we have from 5.30 to 6.30 every night. So we have a half an hour break. So we get the kids home. Leaders take a minute to like collect themselves. And then we do middle school. So um, kind of our format for that, we introduce these kids to worship. Um, for a lot of our middle school kids, this is a new thing. Um, and so we are looking for someone who would do a playlist, like a YouTube playlist, and pick some songs that middle schoolers enjoy and teach kids what it is to worship. Um, Trevor's done that in the past. He's feeling strongly this year to take a step back from that and do more discipleship with some of our high school kids who are stepping into more of a worship team role. Um, so he's going to be stepping out, so we need somebody to step into that. You don't want me in that role. Um, same thing, we're looking for somebody to be up front, to check people in and out. We're looking for someone who's willing to have some conversations about behavior. Um, we're looking for small group leaders. Again, um, men, we need you. These middle school boys 
need men who are loving Jesus, um, who can just check in with them. Um, small group time, you'll notice, for middle school is only 15 minutes. So we're going to do a big group lesson all together, then we're going to divide up. Um, small groups work best if you have five or six per group. If we only have two leaders and you have 15 kids in a small group, it's not going to work super well. Um, and sometimes that's what we ran into last year. So the more help that we have, um, the more it lightens the load for our volunteers. So if you are willing to spend 15 minutes with a group of middle schoolers, and sometimes you watch the video and you literally just look at these kids and you go, how was your week? How are you doing? Um, and that's it, right? Like, and if they know that they are loved by the Father and loved by you, mission accomplished. You've had a good small group. Um, same thing, we need helpers. So if you're not comfortable, again, in that 15-minute teaching role, um, we invite you to come as a helper, sit alongside one of us who is comfortable, and we will train you up in that. Um, we also need substitutes. So we know life happens, right? We have five kids. Um, kids get sick. Things happen. So if you're not willing to commit every week, but you're willing to be somebody that they can call if we need you, um, that's a great way to help too. And then our last group um, is our high school group. So they meet from 7 to 8.30. So they get an extra half hour. Um, this is really exciting. When we started Impact, um, I think we had three high school students. Um, and now it's not uncommon to have 50 high schoolers on a night. Um, and so this is where our small group time is bigger. So I think we have 40 minutes scheduled for small group time. Um, you guys, we have some high school kids who are on fire for the Lord, who are bravely wearing their Jesus is Lord and their salty shirts to school, who are being baptized, who are um, ready to be on mission now for Jesus. And so it's a joy. Um, this group is really a joy. So we eat together and then the kitchen crew can go home and then we come up and we worship. Um, and then we have a large group te teaching time and then we divide up into our small groups and then we wrap up at 8.30. So same, um, you know, we're looking for someone to check in, check out, we take the phones, that's been a huge gift. Um, if you're willing to sit up front, check them in and take their phone and give it back at the end of the night, that would be a huge help to have somebody in that position. Um, yeah, it's a joy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we need your help. Um, first of all, would you pray for us? Um, every Wednesday, when you know impact is happening from 4 to 8.30, would you just be in prayer, praying against um, the enemy? Um, he has shown up where, God at, where God's at work. Satan is not far behind. And so would you be praying for the leaders? Would you be praying for the students? Um, and then if you're willing, would you join the team? Um, when we look at gospel community mission, the community that I have with the team that helps show up every Wednesday night. It is such a sweet time, and those are some of my closest relationships. So there's something so special about serving together and being on mission together, um, even as a husband and wife team. You know, it's something Trevor and I do together. And if you ask these kids um, what a healthy marriage looks like, a lot of them don't know. They don't, they, they don't see that, it's not modeled for them. So getting to show that every week is a gift. Um, and then financially, you guys, we do these retreats throughout the years, throughout the year, sorry, in January is our most expensive. It's our high school retreat, and I think it's 180 per person. Um, so for these high school kids, that's a, it's a lot. Um, a lot of them, it's hard for their parents, it's hard for them. What would it look like as a church body if you um, went up to a high schooler and you said, hey, I see you boldly standing for Jesus, and I want to cover your retreat cost? Like, what would that look like? That would be something this kid would remember forever. Um, so if you can give financially, um, we would love your support that way. Um, so we have our team meeting this Wednesday here at the church at 7 o'clock. If you are interested in serving in any capacity, if you are willing, I'm going to have a sign-up sheet in the back. If you would just put your name and phone number, um, and then any area you feel led to serve, I'll be in contact with you, and then we will sit down Wednesday night at 7 this week and talk through some of the details. Um, and then Impact starts back September 20th, so if you would just be praying. We'll have more, like, handouts, hopefully, if I get someone to help me print handouts, in the weeks to come where we can start inviting our friends' kids and neighbors' kids, and 
If you are a youth, first through 12th grade, uh, I would love for you to join us on Wednesday nights. It really is such a sweet time. Um, I think I asked for 10 minutes and I took way longer, so <laughs> sorry about that. It's all good. Thank you. So we see that uh, being a follower of Jesus is actually a whole lot more than attending a service on Sunday morning, right? It's a whole life commitment that uh, we serve, we get connected, we do the one another's. Um, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so we're going to encourage you to say yes. Uh, a lot of you have been asking and saying, how do we get involved? How do we get connected? This is a great way to do it. All right. This is a great, great way to be on mission for Jesus in our community. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to have a call to worship this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. This is First Chronicles 16. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the people are only idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering to him and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established and it shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns on his throne right now, today. And so let's all stand and begin to worship him. Sing better as one day. Your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. Sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you place your glory dwells. Let's sing those lines again. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory Your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. My heart, my heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your 
spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. I sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. I sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand years is for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, Lord, I'll worship your holy name, Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Amen. 
from all the days, right? All right, let's sing It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea song oh sin of oh the bliss of the glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord god that is where we are at lord Uh, god we are so thankful that you sent your one and only son to die for us on the cross and we are so thankful that jesus was willing to do that that he took the nails that we we deserve them, God. Um, without him, we would, not, we would not be right with you. And so, God, um, we lift your name on high this morning. We worship you this morning and praising you, saying thank you for taking my sin from me. 
Um, thank you for taking our sin from us through Jesus, through that plan that you had in Genesis at the beginning, God. Lord, I pray for Nathan as he comes up today. God, I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. Give him the words that we need to hear this morning and help us to have the hearts that receive this message and that hear it and that will take it to, the, to our friends and our groups and just saying, like, look at what God has done in my life. Um, he has done this. He has changed me. And so, Lord, we love you so much and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, can you hear me? This is the time for the little ones to head back. Uh, we got some little ones to, for kids' church downstairs. We got some great workers. They're gonna care for them and give them a kids' lesson. For those of you that are here for the first time or here in a her first time in a while, we're we've begun a study through the book of Isaiah. And we're in starting chapter three today. We've already made it to chapter three. And um, it's just talking about, uh, the book of Isaiah is talking about the breakdown of, of the people of God, the breakdown of the nation of Judah. And I, we don't have to stretch to find some application in our lives today. Everywhere we look around us today, we see um, a societal and social and spiritual disintegration. And so here in chapter 3, Isaiah illustrates the consequences that the people's arrogant rebellion against him brings. Um, our choices have confident, uh, consequences. And so Isaiah kind of paints uh, a, a stark picture of Jerusalem that's besieged, um, and first by the Assyrian uh, army that's going to come in, and then later the Babylonians. And it's a devastating thing to happen because ultimately Judah and Jerusalem are conquered all her fighting men, all the leaders are destroyed. And, and it's, that's not just a metaphor for the societal breakdown. This was a prophecy that would soon become a reality um, in, in the lives of these people. And these things actually happened that Isaiah was prophesying. But even in the midst of God bringing his hand of judgment, removing his hand of blessing from his people who had abandoned him, he hadn't abandoned them, they had abandoned him. And so he removed his hand of blessing and even brought his hand of discipline like any good father would do. So Isaiah sees God's hand in all of this. There is a glimmer of hope, even though it's a dark picture. And God speaks really bluntly in Isaiah about the mess that his people are in. Uh, but he reaffirms over and over again his love for them. And although his confrontation of their sin is very real and the consequences are devastatingly terrible, they stand in the larger story of God's grace and the story of redemption, that God redeems his people, that God saves sinners, and he will save his people, and ultimately, through them, all the nations of the world will be blessed because Messiah will come through them uh, 700 years after this prophecy, prophecy is made. And so even today, God is moving us toward, we talked about this last week, the day of the Lord, when God will finally intervene into human history and say, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to deal once and for all with sin. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to redeem and rescue and save my people. And until then, we live in this time between the comings of Jesus where we experience um, the work of God, the grace of God, even his merciful discipline in our lives to prepare us for his return. So let's pick up the story here and and let's go to the first slide, uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty, or some of your translations might have the Lord of hosts. And listen to this, he is taking away from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. All supplies of food, all supplies of water, the hero, the warrior, the judge, the prophet, the diviner, the elder, the captain of 50, the men of rank, the counselor, the skilled craftsman, and the clever enchanter, all these are going to be removed. What do, people, what do God's people stand to lose when they abandon him and go their own way? When they worship other gods and when they rebel against God's good plan and design for their lives? Everything. Everything. They stand to lose uh, supply and support. These two words are the, 
are the masculine and feminine of the same word. And it means they're going it's to, a, it's a Hebrew idiom for everything. Totality, every support without exception, they're going to lose. And, uh, and God is going to do this, and it seems merciless and painful, but he's taking away everything so that he can restore and replace it with something better. He's taking away everything that stabilizes the societal life of uh, uh, Isaiah's generation. If you think about it, basically the people have declared their independence from God. They said, we don't want anything to do with you, God, even though you are our God and we are your people, even though that we occupy this land and, and uh, the city of Jerusalem by your grace and by your deliverance. Uh, you've brought us out of slavery in Egypt. You've given us this land. Um, and you've given us all that we have and all that we are. Our identity as a people are rooted in uh, you, Yahweh. And yet now we want to live life independently of you. We want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. We want to live our lives apart from you. And God says, okay, you want to know what that looks like? I'm going to remove my blessing from you. I'm going I'm to let you have what you want, have it your way. I'm going to let you live your life apart from me and experience the consequences of that. And so he's going to take away everything that stabilizes their societal life. And this is ultimately going to happen when the Assyrians invade and lay siege to Jerusalem. And ultimately, when Jerusalem falls in 586 B.C. with the Babylonians and the destabilizing effect of losing all of their fighting men, all of their leaders, all of their judges and prophets and uh, captains and counselors. When God's people have rejected God and his covenant requirements for them, and this is what was required to have his ongoing uh, provision and protection and blessing in their lives, just as he warned them. He said, if you choose to live independently of me, if you choose not to obey me, if you choose not to walk with me, then I'm going to have to remove my blessing. I'm going to have to remove the things uh, that you are now trusting in other than me. And, I'm a, and hopefully the goal of all of that is not just to be punitive, it's to bring you back to me. It's to bring you to repentance and obedience and to restore our relationship, to reconcile us. And so I, Isaiah begins to paint this picture, this description of a collapsing society where people would actually acutely feel the loss of their relationship with God and all the blessings and privileges that came with it. The loss of basic material needs, food and water. How long can a society s survive without food and water? And this happened when they were uh, under siege in Jerusalem. And uh, it, was with, it had devastating consequences, famine. Um, and death and destruction in the city, illness and sickness. God only doesn't, not only removes their supply and support of their basic needs, but he removes their military security. The, the army that they were relying in under David and Solomon, the most powerful armies of Israel in, uh, in the known world at that time. And God's removed all of their fighting men, their heroes, their warriors are gone, those people that they looked to for their protection, and it left them vulnerable and unprotected. And God removes the stable leadership that they've had, uh, their executive leaders, their judicial leaders, their religious leaders, uh, the, the, the mature, wise men and women, their counselors, their thinkers, their business leaders, their skilled laborers. And this is describing when all of those are gone. That describes the complete and total collapse of the command structure of society. Anyone that they would look to for leadership and direction and guidance and counsel and support are now gone. And now what do they do? Leaving the people lost and vulnerable like sheep without a shepherd. And a so social cohesion dissolves into chaos when all the leaders are gone. Let's go on to verse 4 and 5. Let's go to the next slide. And he says, I will make youths their leaders and unstable rulers will govern them. And people will oppress each other, man against man and neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the worthless against the honored. You see that picture of this when the leaders are gone, society begins to collapse. And we live in a time and a culture that idealizes and idolizes our leaders, our celebrities, our, our public figures, our athletes, our musicians. We actually have a, 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 an ongoing show called American Idol, right? We idolize these, these uh, leaders or these public figures. Uh, we idolize success and achievement and beauty and power and wealth and fame. But when we exalt and worship our leaders, what happens to them? They become addicted to that, uh, to that power, to that fame, to that worship that they've been given. And, and pretty soon they begin to think that they're entitled to it, that 
that it rightly belongs to them and they want more of it and there can never be enough of it, this constant clamor for more fame, more power, um, more control. And they begin to abuse their position of leadership and, and use it to oppress the people under them in order to get more power and more wealth and more fame. And so it turns out that our idolizing of our leaders, uh, that our worship of them has been misplaced. We put too much confidence in them. We put too much security in them. We put too much hope in them. Because remember, the best of men are men at best. Uh, they are not to be idolized or worshiped. Worship is reserved for God alone. And God promised, he says, I will not share my glory with another. It's the very first of the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You say, well, we don't worship any gods, don't we? Don't we have our gods? Don't we have our people that we exalt as a stat, to a status even higher than God? And so when those who are called to lead the people fail in their responsibility, and their responsibility is to lead them to God and to humbly serve them and to care for them and, and, and instead expect the people to serve them, and to provide for them, uh, then we have an entire generation of leadership that's going to be overthrown. This is what happened in Israel, and this is what, what, what we see happening in our day as well. The wise, the mature, the experienced, the qualified will be ousted and replaced by the immature and irresponsible boys, youths, who are undiscerning, inexperienced, capricious, unrestrained, and what, does, what, is that, what happens when those who are not able to lead are leading? Those who are not qualified, those who are not mature, those who are not wise. It creates instability and social disorder and anarchy. And so when all the mature men and women, the wise and honorable leaders are gone, society becomes divided, an age gap opens up, unqualified, unstable, unprincipled people take over, assume positions of authority, and society begins to fragment, both socially and morally. And ruthless, power-hungry gangs, like we see sometimes roaming the streets of inner-city Chicago and things like that, they rise up to fill the leadership void and begin to oppress people and, and uh, uh, take advantage of people. The honor code will be completely flipped upside down and discarded in the face of the survival of the fittest, right? Um, the young will rise up against the old, uh, those who are unqualified and undeserving will denigrate those who are honored. And what is behind all this? I mean, why is all this happening? Or rather, we should ask maybe who is behind all this? Well, ultimately, God himself is allowing this to happen. The Lord of hosts, the almighty sovereign God, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, he's not just sovereign to intervene at the end of human history in the last days, but he is actually at work right now today, and he has been at work in, in the detailed ordering of the events of human history. And it's always in accordance with his sovereign will and his righteous character. And so we see that he is actually active, allowing this to happen, bringing us uh, one by one, knocking out the supports and supply, the pillars of, of the people and the things that we've been holding dear and putting our hope and trust and finding our security and our our um, identity in, and he's removing those things so that we can come back and see that he alone is God, and he alone is to be worshiped, and he alone is in control. We see the message of Daniel to the Babylonian king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when he prophesied some two years, 200 years uh, 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 before this, uh, sorry, 200 years after, when he said, the most high God is sovereign over the kings of men, and he gives them to whoever he chooses. The Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and he gives them to whomever he chooses. See, we think we're autonomous and that we are uh, the masters of our own fate and that we're charting our own course, and God says, no, I'm the Most High God. I'm sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and I am allowing this to go on. I am giving them to whomever I choose. And so if youth are leading, this means that God is allowing it to happen. It's not his good plan. He would rather them, all the way back uh, in the wilderness, that they were... God, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will lead you and you will follow me. It was uh, back in the day when Israel first became, became a nation, they were a theocracy. There was no monarchy. There was no king. God himself was their king and they followed him. And, but they rejected him as their king. They made some other kings who followed their own desires and felt like they were leading and it was their kingdom and it was their power and it was their 
rule, and God has to remind us and remind the people that he ultimately is in charge. Let's go on to the next slide, verse 6 and 7. This is what happens in this leadership vacuum. A man will seize one of his brothers in his father's house and say, you have a cloak, you be our leader. Take, heart, take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day, he'll cry out, I don't have any remedy. I don't have food or clothing in my house. Don't make me the leader of this people. So in this leadership vacuum, uh, with the breakdown of societal order and uh, the breakdown of public sentiment and public spirit, there's a hopeless despair that sets in. No one takes leadership seriously. I mean, there's zero public trust and confidence in the leadership. And so in their desperation, people will look around for someone, anyone, to provide guidance and courage in this important moment. No thought or time or effort will be given to search for uh, the best, most qualified candidate. But whoever happens to be convenient will be hastily put, put forward. Here, you be our leader. You have a pulse. But no one's going to be willing. Like, don't look at me. I don't want to. Who wants that job? I don't want that job. I don't have a remedy. I can't cure the ills of Jerusalem. Don't look at me. I can't fix this mess. I don't have the resources necessary. So what we've got is, in the absence of true leadership, we've got a woeful incompetence, a lack of qualification, skills, a lack of character, and it turns public leaders into a laughingstock, a joke. And behind this character, caricature lies the reality that in a day when they are so desperately needed that there's an unwillingness to accept responsibility for others. Um, Isaiah is describing the breakdown in national character and a breakdown in uh, a serious um, responsibility that comes with leadership. And so the warning for every generation is this. One way God brings judgment to his people is by depriving them of worthy, competent leaders. He helps them to see what life is like without a leader who has God as their Lord. And it gets ugly and it gets dark. And he brings them, hopefully brings them back to the place where they cry out to God in repentance and come back to God. So what happens when a nation loses its leaders? When its leaders are irresponsible or incompetent or unwilling to take responsibility? Well, the center of society no longer holds together. There's a breach and there's brokenness, and there's chaos and disorder. Let's look in verse 8 and 9. Let's go to the next slide here. Why does society come apart? Why does this happen? Well, Isaiah, God through Isaiah tells us in verses 8 and 9, Jerusalem has stumbled. Judah has fallen. Why? Because they've spoken and acted against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. Like Sodom, they flaunt their sin. They don't even hide it. Woe to them. They brought this disaster upon themselves. So why is this happening? Why does this happen to a society? Why does social disintegration happen in a culture? Why would God uh, remove the supports and allow society to collapse? It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It isn't the result of failed policies. Uh, uh, lack of tax dollars to be thrown at the problem. Society comes apart and ultimately collapses because of a moral and spiritual erosion and decay of its people. And so Isaiah traces all of this back to the root cause, and that is speech and conduct that is deliberately rebellious and defiant against God. God is the orderer of society. God is the orderer of government. The, the building block of every society is the nuclear family. Uh, we've got God established the family, and God established the church, and God established government ultimately so that uh, to reward the righteous, to punish the wicked, to keep order in society. But when we've rejected God and his law and his lordship and rulership over all of society, then it comes apart. And when we defy God through our speech and our conduct, the, the words here actually means literally defying the eyes of his glory. That is, the eyes of God's glory, we're, we're talking about him seeing everything. He observes everything that is offensive to his holiness in a society. And Isaiah, Isaiah is bringing this charge against the people, and he's saying, look, this is all your fault. You've rejected 
the word of the Lord. You've rejected the law of the Lord. You've rejected the prophets of God. Every time he sends a prophet to you, you stone him or kill him or you ignore him. And instead, you've, you, you're defying the, 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 the Lord. You're defying God by the way you speak, the way you act, the way you think. Through your speech, your immoral, idolatrous behavior, your treatment of the poor and the vulnerable among you, and your arrogant self-absorption, all of that has brought this disaster upon yourself. It's interesting that he says your speech. You know, the sins of, uh, of speech are one of the most lightly, lightly regarded in all of all sins today. We don't, we tend to think of, of our actions um, and, and, you know, sinful acts of commission that we, that we, that we do, but we, we rarely think about the weight of our words. The Bible tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, blessing and cursing, that uh, words fitly spoken can build up and give life, but words can take away and damage and, des- and destroy. And so we can sin against God and each other with our words. And God takes that very, very seriously. It's one of the most serious sins from his perspective. But these sins weren't just occasional sins. These weren't just occasional lapses in judgment or, or sins that they committed in ignorance and like, you know, we just, we, need, we, we weren't thinking, we didn't realize this. No, he's saying, listen, you're not even trying to hide it. You're like Sodom. You're flaunting your sin. You're not even trying to hide it. This, is, this, is, this was publicly flaunted, shamelessly brazen way of life for them. They had rejected God, and they were living in such a way that was an offense to him on a daily basis, and he'd had enough of it. He says, they wear who they are and tell who they are just by the look on their faces and their defiant parading of their sin in the streets. They live live as if God is completely irrelevant to the whole of their lives. They're living as if God didn't exist. And in Isaiah's day, society had run so far from God and his truth and his light that what people had used to be ashamed of and would hide and do in secret, they now flaunted and paraded out in public, celebrating and taking pride in their sin. But what God says is sin is sin, regardless of what society says about it or regardless of how society perceives it. Not only that, but sin is self-destructive and it robs us of joy and peace. And ultimately, sin will be the death of us. It will destroy us. It will destroy a society. And he says, woe to them. They brought this disaster upon themselves. So before we go pointing the finger, however, listen to this. I know we all tend to go, yeah, see, look at this pagan culture around us. It's coming apart. The pagan cultures around them were not the problem. Isaiah said that God's people had brought this disaster upon themselves. God does exist, even though sometimes we act as if he doesn't. And he's called us into relationship with him through repentance and faith. He's called his people to walk in his will and his way, to model for the society what it looks like to be rightly related to God. And so here's the deal. God's people will either delight in his glorious presence or defy his glorious presence. Those are the two options, right? Everything hinges upon this. You will either delight in God's glorious presence or you will defy it. And when God's people defy it, and reject the God of, uh, of the Bible and reject his righteous rule in their lives, then the wheels come off. And so society is coming apart because the, ch- the church, the people of God in its midst, are not following their God, are not doing what they are, not being a light, an example to the nations, are not being agent of change and uh, preservation and redemption in that culture. Let's go on to verse 10. Tell the righteous it will be well with them. Here's a glimmer of hope. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. But woe to the wicked, it will go badly for them, for they have done uh, what they have done will be done to them. And then he says, Youths oppress my people, women rule over them. My people, your leaders mis- are misleading you, they're turning you from the path. So this is the glimmer of hope in the middle of this dark prophecy, right? God promises that justice ultimately will be done. This is the good news, that God is just, that he sees, that he knows. Sometimes when we're looking around and we see all the injustice going on, we're going, this isn't right. When, when will justice be done? And he's saying, listen, I see, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping account, I'm keeping score. I will ensure that justice will be done. This is the principle of just reward, that each one will reap what he has sown. 
And this applies both to the righteous and to the wicked. First, there's a promise of a righteous remnant. Not all the people of society have rejected God and are defying his glorious presence. There are some who are faithful, and it will be well with them. Those who haven't worshipped other gods, those who remain pure and faithful in the midst of a corrupt pagan society, they will be acknowledged and rewarded. They will get their due. And this is hard, right? It's really challenging to stand alone for righteousness in a pagan culture. Listen, this is important for you to understand that Christianity has always been and continues to this day to be a countercultural movement. But it's hard because we don't like to stand out. We don't like to go against the flow. It's disheartening to be mocked or persecuted for not going along with the beliefs, values, and behaviors of the crowd around us. And I think about all you students that are headed back to school uh, this week. Um, you need to prepare yourselves to be questioned and challenged, maybe even mocked for your faith. We talked about, she talked about how brave and courageous it is for you to wear your salty or your Jesus is a Lord shirt. Um, expect to take some heat for that. Um, because uh, this culture and your peers are going to pressure you to conform to their beliefs, values, and behaviors, right? Uh, they want you to go along with them, right? And you'll be tempted to do it because it's easier to, to, to go along at, in order to get along and not make waves and not rock the boat. But you can't. Uh, God needs the righteous to stand up in a dark day uh, and to hold the line, right? Uh, you, you can't give in or compromise what you know to be true and right and good. You can't participate or condone or celebrate sin. It defies the glorious presence of God in us. So you've got to hold fast to the truth. You've got to walk in the light. You've got to love uh, what is right and true and good. And you take heart. God promises that ultimately he sees that and he will honor that. And he will ensure that justice is be done. You, justice will be done. You will be rewarded for that. And those who are giving you grief will be rewarded for that. Those who've been faithful in righteousness will be rewarded. And those who are proud of their sins will be given their reward too. Also, I'll remind you that, that the righteous are not, this is, a, this is an important understanding. This might be a hard, hard thing to hear. The righteous are not promised immunity. This doesn't mean, you know, the righteous, it'll, everything will go well with you. If you do what is right, if you go to church and you uh, uh, don't compromise your faith and you stay pure, that everything's going to go well with you. You're never going to have any trouble. You're never going to have any problems. You're never going to have any pushback. It's, that's not the reality. This isn't a promise of immunity from suffering or persecution or even the general consequences of living in a society that's collapsing, collapsing in on itself. In fact, Jesus told his disciples just the opposite. He says, listen, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to live how I live, if you're going to say what I say, if you're going to do what I do, if you're going to treat people the way I treated you, you know, we think sometimes that's going to be our get out of jail free card. That's going to be our immunity card. He says, if you do that, if you live how I live and say what I say and do what I do, you're going to be treated how I was treated. And how was he treated? He was hated. He was rejected. He was a man of grief and, and, and constantly uh, in sorrow because people rejected him. They hated him. They persecuted him. Ultimately, they killed him. And all but one of his 12 original disciples. Uh, he, he wasn't as popular as we want to make him out to be, right? When you say Jesus is Lord of my life and you wear that shirt, that means I'm going to be living in a way that's very different from the society around me. And then he says this, uh, this the, the Hebrew translation doesn't actually, the, this translation doesn't reflect the original Hebrew, but uh, he's making two exclamations. This is God crying out. Two outraged and heartbroken explanation, uh, exclamations here. He says, my people, my people, youths are oppressing you. My people, your leaders are leading you astray. He's crying out in both outrage and heartbreak because his people are precious to him, even though they're rebelling against him, even though they're defying his glorious presence and, and acting as if he didn't exist. He doesn't want, and he, he ultimately loves them and wants to redeem them, restore them, and those who harm them will do so at their own peril. He says, this is what's happened. Leadership's been corrupted and compromised. And, and again, what happens in a leadership vacuum? Well, incapable, unqualified, inadequate leaders fill the void. Youth step up. Youth oppress. Women rule. 
And these were two categories of people in that society who had neither the training nor the status to provide leadership, but there was no one else. They stepped up and filled the void. And we see this over and over again in the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. If the king was weak and infantile and a spoiled brat, then you could almost bet that he had many wives who were manipulating him, right? Like like weak King Ahab and his controlling, manipulative wife Jezebel, who was the ultimate dominating and controlling power behind his throne. And, and it, to devastating consequences for the people. The, see, the primary responsibility of the leaders of Israel and the primary responsibility of any leader is to lead the people in the way of God and to care for them and to, to, uh, to shepherd them and to love them and to serve them. But these leaders had instead done the very opposite. The old established signposts posts of the law that God said, this is how kings should lead and this is the direction they should lead them in accordance with my laws so that they can have my blessing. They'd been removed, intentionally removed, and um, forgotten. No wonder society was coming apart. When they rejected God and his will and his way and his righteous rule and his righteous laws, society can't exist in that kind of a spiritual and moral vacuum. Let's go on to the next slide, verse 13. So the Lord exposes these leaders, and he calls them to court and brings formal charges against them. Listen, the Lord rises to argue the case. He stands to judge the people, and the Lord brings this charge against the elders and leaders of the people. Here's what he says. You have devastated my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. Why do you crush my people? Why do you grind the faces of the poor, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. These charges are brought against both the leaders and the elders. Leaders and elders are reflecting all three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, and all of them were corrupt. These charges are serious and devastating. Instead of, so so in the Old Testament, God often uses this illustration of a vineyard to, to, to talk about his people. He says, I, I, I planted a vineyard. I got the choicest vines and I cultivated the choicest soil and I, I, I built a, a, a fence around it and I put a tower to protect it and I, I did everything to, to um, get the best grapes from my vineyard and I only got sour grapes or none at all, no fruit at all. Sour grapes, terrible fruit. And this is what he's talking about, his people. I did everything for the, for the success and well-being of my people and what did I get back from them? Idolatry, immorality rejection, rebellion. They defy my glorious presence. And it, and it came from the leadership. Instead of doing what they should have been doing, cultivating and watering and nurturing and weeding and protecting his vineyard, which was really his people who had been trusted to their leadership. Instead, they devastated or ravaged. The, the, the language here is you literally uh, devastated, you stripped my vineyard bare. In the Old Testament, uh, the people, when they would harvest the grapes and the figs and the olives, they were to leave. They were called, by the law of God, required to leave some grapes and to leave some figs and to leave some olives. For who? The poor. They were allowed to come, come into the fields and to glean after the harvest all that was left so that they could have some, some, something to subsist on, something to survive with. But he says, you have gone over the vines again and again and again, leaving nothing. For the poor. Rather than living your lives as leaders to cultivate the fruitful lives of others, these wicked leaders had stripped them bare. They'd not only left no gleanings for the poor, but they plundered what meager possessions the poor had had. They went into their houses and took every last thing that they had. They gave nothing to the people and they took everything. This is what he meant by crushing and grinding the poor. It's the idea of extracting every last benefit from them until they are reduced to dust. Ezekiel the prophet says the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 34. You ought to read that that time sometime. That is a picture uh, or an illustration of God entrusting uh, his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, to the shepherds of Israel. And he says, instead of feeding the flock, you fed yourselves. You were slaughtering the sheep You were taking the wool and you were eating the mutton. You were eating uh, the lambs. 
the very lambs that you were called to protect. And then instead of uh, protecting them from the ravaging wolves, you would just let them, left them fend for themselves. You wandered off and they were scattered like sheep. You didn't bind up the broken, uh, the, the wounded. You didn't care for uh, the hurt or you didn't go after the lost. And so, so she said, so I'm going to come and I'm going to hold you accountable, you faithless shepherds. See, the mark of a true social morality uh, of leaders and, and a culture that reflects God's love and care and concern for the poor and needy. That's what he expects of leaders. That's what he expects of his people. See, God's, ha- God's people have a responsibility to the broken, the hurting, the poor, the needy, the outcasts among us. And so how we treat the least of these is the real true evidence that the Spirit of God is among us, that we're delighting in God's presence, not defying it. See, if we love God's presence rather than defy it, we will not say, the poor are my responsibility. Let somebody else take care of them. Let somebody else do it. No, we choose to help them. We choose to come alongside them. And those of us who lead should lead by example, by being life enrichers, not life depleters, not taking away, but enhancing and giving all that we have and all that we are for the benefit of those around us. But look, let's go on to verse 16. It isn't only the men and the leaders who failed to lead that led to societal collapse. Look, look, there's another category here. The Lord also says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, jingling their ankle bracelets, the Lord will put scabs on the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will shave their scalps bald. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 18. On that day, the Lord will strip their finery, ankle bracelets, headbands, crescents, pendants, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle jewelry, sashes, perfume bottles, amulets, signet rings, nose rings, festive robes, capes, cloaks, purses, garments, linen clothes, turbans, shawls. Look at how how many times he says instead of. Instead of perfume, there'll be a stench. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of beauty, Uh, Beautifully styled hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothes, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. This is probably the most graphic of all the indictments of human arrogance. You've seen this pattern over again in chapters 1, 2, now in chapter 3 of Isaiah, that the ultimate issue is human arrogance. We want to be God. We want to rule our own lives. We do not want to have God ruling over us. And so we reject him, we defy him, and we live our own lives as if we are God and as if he doesn't exist. And God says, I'm done with that. And so God tells him what else he's going to remove or strip away. Not only their supply and support, not only all their leaders and and most of their men, but also the pride and security of the women of Judah in their possessions and in their beauty and in their social status. This is not a polemic or an indictment against having or wearing nice clothes or jewelry, so don't hear that, women. It's an indictment on those who find their identity and security in these things and arrogantly flaunt their external beauty with their beauty products and clothes and jewelry and accessories. Everything they do is designed to attract attention. It would seem that 8th century B.C. in Judah was not that much different from our culture today. They were absolutely obsessed with external beauty and all that goes along with it. They put more time and energy and money and focus and emphasis on the worship of beauty than on the worship of God, and that's idolatry. The women of Jerusalem did not recognize their own self-conceit, their own pride. We talked about this last week, remember, which C.S. Lewis declared that pride is the essential vice, the utmost evil, the complete anti-God state of mind. And God likens the nation of Judah to a haughty woman whose entire attention is given to her appearance and her image. They had sought to exalt themselves with every kind of external material accoutrement and had seductively pursued other lovers. And the inventory of fancy clothes and jewelry of the women parallels the same failure in the leadership of the men. Pride, arrogance, uh, 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 self-obsession with power and wealth. Both the men and the women, in their own ways, fell short of the glory of God, defied the glory of God. And when men use their power to oppress the poor and to enrich themselves, and when women arrogantly parade in shallow, false beauty, 
uh, for their own identity and security. This is not the glory of God. This is not the delight in the glory of God that he created us for. And he will strip us bare of all false glory and all false security in order to humble us and to bring us to repentance. See, the women here were seeking to attract, but God's response to them humbles them and actually makes them repulsive. And he says here, I'm going to strip off the beautiful clothing and I'm going to replace it with a strip of sackcloth held up by a piece of rope to cover their nakedness. This actually happened when conquering nations would come in and kill all the men and all the soldiers and all the leaders, usually in front of their wives and children. And then they would bring the wives and children out literally and strip them bare. Sometimes they could find a piece of sackcloth or burlap, something to tie around them with a rope, a piece of rope that they could get to try to cover their nakedness. But they would be exposed and, 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 and be in shame. They would uh, shave their heads bald. The arrogant heads once held high would be bowed to the ground in shame. The beautifully styled hair would be shaved off and reveal sores and scabs. They'd been starving for months and months behind the wall in the siege. And they were sick and unhealthy and scabby. And their beauty was long gone, their physical beauty. And then they would be literally branded as slaves and carried off to Assyria or carried off to Babylon. Listen, hear me when I say this. It's, this isn't a polemic against having nice clothes. It's not a sin to have and enjoy nice things. The sin is in the arrogance and in the sufficiency and, then, and in the finding my significance and meaning and purpose in these things, in my beauty, in my image, in my stuff. The haughty spirit, the seeking their identity and their external beauty and possessions. L- listen to what Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Pull up 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. He says, this is, this is a contrast between external beauty and internal beauty. And he says this, Peter, the apostle Peter says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornments, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that, that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy men of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves and they submitted themselves to their own husband. So he's talking about a contrast between a woman who delights in God and a woman who delights in herself. A godly woman is radiantly beautiful, whatever her age and whatever her features, because her beauty is the unfading beauty of the spirit in her, the spirit of God radiating from her that makes her beautiful at any age and whatever she's wearing and That is what God values, that beautiful spirit, that inner spirit that submits to God and his lordship and leadership and uh, delights in the glory of God rather than the glory of herself. Let's go on to verse 25. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors will fall in battle, and then the gates of Jerusalem will lament and mourn. Deserted, she will sit on the ground, and in that day, Seven women will take hold of one man and say, we'll eat our own food, we'll we'll even provide our own clothes, only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. This is how drastic and dark it become. God will remove the pride and arrogance of both the men and the women. And when judgment comes to Jerusalem through invading Assyrians and Babylonians and Jerusalem is besieged, the casualty rate among the men will be six out of seven killed. That's 85% of the men will be killed. And in a society uh, where a woman's security, her protection, her provision came from her husband and her sons, that's devastating. What, what happens to a woman when there's no man to protect and provide for her? No men in the society whatsoever. Well, strong men from the Assyrians and strong men from the Babylonians um, rape and capture and con- conquer and subjugate. And so in utter humiliation, these women will beg a man, any man, to give her his name without any obligation on his part at all. That's how low it had gotten. And when men are desperate, they'll grab a hold of anyone and try to make him their leader in a pitiful attempt to escape social chaos. Here, you lead us. And in, and in their desperation, women will uh, desperately grab a hold of a man in a pitiful attempt to escape personal shame. But when God has taken away their support and their supply 
and their leaders and their men and their finery and their beauty. They will lament and mourn and sit on the ground empty. The final degradation of human pride. God will do what it takes to bring us to the end of ourselves. And he will remove our supports and the things that we're leaning on, the things that we're trusting in, things that we're putting our security and our hope in. And God's people will suffer loss upon loss, all that they're relying on, everything that they're putting their hope in other than God. And it's, a, it's an act of mercy and grace that he'll strip away these things until we are empty and cry out to, and turn back to him and cry out to him. And he does this again and again and again in human history. And he's doing it again today to restore his people to true worship and faithfulness and obedience and holiness. Listen to what Jesus says about his church in the last days in Revelation chapter 3. Let's go to the next slide. Here's his church in Revelation chapter 3. You say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I don't need anything. We're doing great. But you don't realize that you're wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. I advise for you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. I'm not talking about literal gold. Uh, wear white clothes to wear. He's talking about purity here. So that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, God says, I rebuke. This is Christ. And I discipline. So be earnest and repent. This is what he wants from us. This is the response he's looking for. Humility, repentance, uh, a turning back to him in faith and hope. So the question for you and I today is this. What do we need to be emptied of? What are we propping ourselves up with? What is our support and our pillars? What are we looking to for our hope and our security and our identity? Let's go to the, the last few verses here. Let's go to the next slide. Here's God's gracious remedy. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. And those who are left in Zion, and it won't be many, who remain in Jerusalem will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. So a spiritual crisis, a moral collapse cannot be fixed by new political leaders or new, uh, new policies. It requires far more than failed political promises. Uh, hope and change or, or make Jerusalem great again is not going to get it done. No, no spiritual or moral collapse requires a spiritual solution, not a political one. It requires a spiritual savior, not a, not a political leader with a Messiah complex. This is a sin issue. It's not a policy issue, and it needs to be dealt with on the heart level, and only God can do the work. And with all that God has taken away, we would expect him to give something back here, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't necessarily give everything back that they'd lost. Instead, he creates something new, something better that he, than, than what he took away. At first, we cringe when he says, in that day, because we're like, oh, the day of the Lord, judgment's coming. And yes, that's true. But here we see a vision of the coming of the branch of the Lord, who is the righteous judge of all the earth, but he's coming back to redeem and to restore and to make all things new. This title, Branch of the Lord, is, is a messianic title that points to the kingly and priestly offices of Messiah. And branch is a, is a family tree metaphor. You get it? It's, the branch is growing out of the root, the stump of Jesse. In Jeremiah, Messiah is the branch of David or the stump of Jesse. Only here, this is the only place in all the Old Testament where uh, he is described as the branch of the Lord. The idea that Messiah has a dual lineage. He is both the son of David and the son of God. He is both uh, uh, God and man, 100% God and 100% man. And the people had sought uh, a false beauty and a false glory and a false worship apart from God. And in that day, the day of the Lord, when Messiah returns, they will see a true beauty and a true glory in him. And he's going to redeem and restore the true beauty of holiness in his people. What, a, what an awesome hope and what a glorious remedy. Sadly, though, not everyone's going to enjoy his return. It says here he's going to be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. There's going to be a devastated, devastating purge, purging. Uh, after judgment, there will be some left over, a few who've escaped the, the, the consequences of their rebellion against God, of defying his glory. They will have escaped the calamity of Assyria and Babylon and the captivity which overwhelmed everyone else and he says but this group will will be a spiritually changed group 
uh, there will be no more false worship. There will be no more rivals for his glory. No glorifying of ourselves. Uh, no more oppressing the poor. No more swollen egos on that day. Let's go on to verse 4 and 5. And this is the end. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the blood stains from Jerusalem by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of fire. And the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming, flaming fire by night. See, the people of God need a cleansing from sin. And who does it? The spirit of judgment and the spirit of fire. This is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit in John 16. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And the Spirit will come as the refining fire in judgment and fire. We don't find our hope in avoiding judgment. That's what we kind of long for. The people of God say, we hope that when, when Christ returns, we, we're going to avoid the consequences of all this rebellion in us and all the rebellion around us. But actually, we don't find our hope in avoiding the judgment. We find our hope in going through it. This is the refining fire of God's holiness, the burning coal with which God purifies us, and it brings us to the place of repentance, confession and repentance. And without it, without the burning fire of God's judge, judgment and the refining fire of his Holy Spirit, we will remain as we are. But if we submit to the Spirit's burning and judgment in our lives, if we're remade and recreated in his holy likeness, then Jesus will stand as our only beauty and only pride, and we will delight once again in his glorious presence. And then God will promise us here that he, we, he will once again make his dwelling among his people, this beautiful picture of uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, the manifest presence of his, uh, the manifest um, evidence of his presence with his people like he did back in the wilderness, right? In the day of the Lord, though, his glorious presence, presence won't just fill a tabernacle or some temple in Jerusalem. It will cover over all of Mount Zion and all her assembles, uh, assemblies. All of his people will be covered by the manifest presence of the holy glory of God. This is where history is headed to the time when Christ will return to bring justice to the righteous and to reward the wicked and make all things new and to establish his glorious presence. And his presence is going to be over all the earth, over all the remnant, over all the survivors, his people, his bride, the church. And look in last verse, verse 6. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. This is a beautiful picture of a wedding canopy that celebrates the wedding of Jesus and his bride, the church a gloriously radiant and holy church that has been purified by the Spirit without spot or wrinkle because she's been washed clean and she will be sheltered and protected by Christ's glorious presence forever. What a beautiful picture, right? He will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. So the central issue for you and I today and actually facing God's people in every age is always our sinful tendency to exalt ourselves and to trivialize God, to act as if we are God and, it, and to live our lives apart from his glorious presence, act as if he doesn't exist. Because, our, because of our fundamental insecurity, we seek to create our own security through the accumulation of wealth or education or power or beauty or position or whatever we seek to fill it with. But we wrongly think, uh, because we wrongly think of the guaranteeing of our own security, we think that's the most important thing. I've got to be secure, and so I seek my security in any way, in anything that I can. But we wrongly think about that. Um, we, we, are, we, we, we need to recognize that our security comes from God alone. Our security can't come from the manipulation of, of the world and the world system. That, that just leads to idolatry and immorality and, and defiance of God. We don't recognize uh, the reality because of our sin that, that, that we are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. We are alienated and separated from God. The most important goal is not seeking our own security wherever we can find it, but the most important goal of our lives is to be rightly related to our Creator who alone can hold us securely and we can find our hope and our help in Him. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the power of your word and the truth of your message. We're grateful for your son, Jesus, that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our rebellion and our, our defiance and our pride and our arrogance, 
you love us and you send your son to redeem us and to make us new and to cleanse us and you sent your spirit to convict us and draw us to yourself and to purify us and to make us holy and make us right with you lord we but this but but repentance is necessary I pray today that you would bring us to the end of ourselves. I pray that if there's anyone here who has never put their hope and trust in you today, they would realize that they're putting their hope and trust in all the wrong things. And men and beauty and wealth and power and leaders will always fail them. But you will never fail. You are the faithful true God and our hope and our, our life and our security is found in you alone. Help us to put no other gods before you, no other false idols. Help us to to jettison these things and come to you in repentance and faith, confessing our rebellion, confessing our idolatry and our immorality, and, and to renew and restore our relationship with you and our hope in you. I pray if, never, if there's anyone that's never done that, today would be the day of salvation. For those of us that have done that, uh, today would be a day of repentance and restoring back to right relationship with you. And we even ask that you would remove the things that we are putting our hope and trust in, remove the supports, that we are finding our security and our identity and anything that's other than you and help us to put our hope in you alone, our trust in you alone. And we'll give you all the glory for what you're going to do in us and through us as we faithfully return back to relationship with you and shine brightly in a broken world. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and close worship service with just the amazing grace that God has bestowed upon us with Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the Lord has promised good My chains are gone, I've been set free, 
my God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun for there to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are So it's a challenge to let go of all the things that we're putting our hope in other than God. It, it won't help. They'll, they'll all fail you at, at some point. And so that's the challenge that we all have, to put, put our hope and trust in God who will never fail you. And if you want to talk about that, if you want to pray about that, if you need some help or some support, if you're, you're, you're going through something, happy to pray with you. We've got some leaders up here that would be happy to pray with you. And so uh, we will make ourselves available after the service, right? Speaking of prayer, if you can believe it, tonight is the last Sunday of August. And so we're going to be praying together as a church tonight. So you're welcome to come and join us in prayer uh, tonight at 7 o'clock right here. And um, have a great week. We'll be praying for you. You'll be praying for us, okay? God bless you.